Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone. Hope you had a great start at BrewCon this morning. Um, so welcome to ECOS Offensive Security Research Logbook. It's a mouthful. Um, it's a condensed presentation of all my ECOS research I did between March 2020 and May 2021. Um, the idea is to share tools and techniques I applied to a custom branch of ECOS so that other researchers can uh, reproduce on other targets. Um, you know the drill, quick disclaimers, um, the views expressed during this presentation are my own and do not reflect those of my past or current employers nor their customers. Um, all the content is CC by Sharealike and a hundred percent of the um, tools and code I will demonstrate today are open source and available on uh, GitHub. Um, quick word about me before we dive in. Uh, I'm Quentin Kaiser. I worked as a consulting pen tester for six years before going on a small sab sabbatical that uh, turned me into a binary analysis nerd. Um, I'm now a security researcher at IoT Inspector Research Lab. Uh, you may have seen our research on the Realtek SDK, Broadcom SDK, and a um, Cisco advisory we released this morning. Um, and I'm currently focusing on binary exploitation of embedded devices and uh, automating bug findings in large uh, firmware blobs. So today's battle plan is quite simple. Uh, we'll start by a quick introduction to ECOS, what it is, what it isn't, where it's deployed, and why it's important. I will then demonstrate how to extract the ECOS firmware from different devices. We'll then analyze them, developing tools and techniques to make uh, that analysis easier for reversers. And once we got a nice disassembled view of the firmware, we'll find bugs, exploit them, and gain long-term persistence. Um, I'll close with a section on future work and research ideas. So let's start by defining what is ECOS. Uh, by a show of hands, who knew about ECOS or played with ECOS in the past? Okay, great. Um, it's a free and open source uh, real-time operating system. It's mostly implemented in C and C++, but some, uh, sometime in pure assembly, we'll see that uh, later. It's built with the one process, multiple threads uh, architecture. And speaking of architecture, it supports a lot of them. Uh, be it ARM, MIP, SuperH, Spark, um, they are uh, supporting it, and it's everywhere. Uh, consumer electronics like the wireless chipsets of PlayStations, uh, networking gears like routers and switches, um, industrial devices like PLCs, payment systems uh, like smart cards, readers you have in shops, um, uh, mostly in Europe, uh, satellites in space, missile launcher controllers, the, most of them run um, on ECOS, and the latest release is close to 10 years old, but given its application, uh, it's there to stay for some time. Taking observer bias in consideration uh, and being fully aware that this is only research uh, content that got released into the, the public domain, this is mostly how I picture the history of ECOS uh, security research. So we can observe three eras. You have the early days, the first memory corruptions, uh, crashes, and the first uh, fully working end-to-end um, -end exploits uh, at the end. So during the early days, we'll see the uh, successive releases of ECOS from 1998 to 2009, at least for the uh, non-commercially supported versions. Uh, but then starting from 2010, we see reports of stack overflows affecting cable modems running on ECOS. Um, and those reports only mention uh, the risk of denial of service, uh, the proof of concept just crash the device. They're not taking um, uh, control of um, devices that are uh, targeted. Interestingly, um, these devices start to appear in 2010 because in 2009, Broadcom starts selling its cable modem packages based on ECOS uh, version 2. Um, in 2016, we see the publication of dedicated uh, reversing tools, one to extract firmware uh, from uh, ECOS-based Broadcom uh, devices, and another to extract the SHROMFS from uh, firmware images. And it, in terms of ECOS-focused security research, it all really started uh, with the release of Cable Owned in uh, 2020. It's a research paper by uh, Liarbird, which uh, uh, demonstrates remote command execution uh, on ECOS devices, mainly the Technicolor and Sagemcom um, cable modems. Um, I got really interested in that uh, paper, and a year later, I released uh, two 
um, uh, research papers, uh, one targeting the Netgear device deployed by uh, VU in Belgium, and the other one targeting AS key devices um, deployed by Orange Belgium. So, um, the first step of our journey is to extract firmware from uh, target devices. Um, these devices being managed by ISPs, uh, their firmware are custom and they cannot be downloaded from the vendor's website. So, like updates are usually applied over TFTP following the DOCSIS protocol, but you can't um, like get the firmware out of it. So we have to extract it from uh, live devices. Thankfully, JC Lenner released a tool called BCM2 Utils that is dedicated to do just that. Um, and we're mostly interested in BCM2 dump, a utility to dump RAM and flash content. It's actually taking advantage of a read memory command that is exposed on the CLI. Um, but before we can dump the memory, we need to gather memory addresses, offsets, and sizes from device in order to write a model specific memory map that will be used by uh, BCM to them to read the memory. Um, so Broadcom cable modems uh, always use two flash uh, storage chips, an SPI flash for bootloaders and non-volatile uh, data, and a non-flash to store the firmware files. You have two images, image one and image two, image two acting as a backup if image one gets corrupted. Um, to get a shell, you have two ways, either connect over Telnet if it's exposed, usually it's not, or connect over uh, UART. Here it's the hardware layout of a Netgear CG series, um, and you have two pinouts. Uh, so some cable modems, most of those uh, Broadcom packages, um, they can run two independent systems. You have the CM for cable modem that runs on ECOS, and the MS for media server that runs on Linux. Uh, that's why you always have between two and three uh, UART pinouts. Uh, you can connect to it using any serial to USB adapter. There I was using the uh, bus pirate, and it will land you on a CM console where you can um, take advantage of building commands to gather information about flash chips in use. Um, calling show under the flash menu will uh, display all the information we need. We first see the SPI flash uh, with the memory map. Um, so you have offset sizes of each region we are inter interested in, the bootloader and the two uh, permanent and dynamic uh, non-volatile data. And then we have the uh, non-flash details, again, with the memory map of that non-flash with offsets and sizes of each region, uh, image one and image two, namely. Using that information, we can write a device profile that is shown on screen. So the NVRAM section corresponds to the SPI flash, and the flash section corresponds to the NVRAM. So we see the offset, the size, and an optional name. So, with that new profile compiled in bcm 2 we can pull the content of the device and at the bottom we can see our firmware image, at least the header, with the uh, firmware name on top. But that was the easy way. Um, so, this works on that device, but some uh, devices have custom settings that can be set by ISPs to disable, disable console access. Um, so, this bcm to dump um, tool has another mode where it will patch bootloader instructions at runtime, so you can uh, you can dump the memory content uh, over a serial connection. But to do that, we need to acquire a dump of the bootloader in order to identify functions we need to patch. So. To dump the bootloader, uh, we need to know where it's mapped in RAM, and the easiest way to do that is to make it crash. Um, that's where, what we are doing here from the bootloader uh, menu. So we are writing a dump instructions at a specific uh, of, uh, address. We jump to it, it crashes, and the return address on the bottom right is actually where it's mapped in RAM. So we just have to dump the RAM content from that address minus, let's say, 1K page for, uh, let's say, 256 kilobytes. Given that our length is longer and like the offsets are wrong, we need to do some cleanup. Uh, it's quite easy to do because before the bootloader, it's full of null bytes. After the bootloader, it's full of 0xffs. So we clean that up. And now that we have a clean bootloader, we can load it in Kidra as a raw MIPS32 big engine image with the base address we just identified uh, before. 
The cool thing is that Protocom uh, boot orders left uh, have lots of logs and debug strings in the final binary, and we can use them to identify functions. So this is an example. Um, it's unnamed because you don't have symbols in true binary, but this is a local for non-flash read colon blah blah blah, and non-flash read is actually the function name. So um, we can write a script to identify locals, ex uh, extract the function name from the local, and rename the function from where it's called using that value. Um, I just did that with radar2 and r2pipe, which allows us to pinpoint uh, the functions we need, namely non-flash read and SPR flash read. We have the function offsets, and we can put that into our uh, BCM2 dump uh, profile. So. Um, you have the offset to read from flash, the offset of the function to read, for, to read from the SPI. The mode is actually the function signature. So when you see BOL, it's buffer offset length. When you see OBL, it's offset buffer length. You also need the um, function offset of printf because we need to print out the content over serial. And in an interesting thing on top is the magic. You have an address and then a value and the tool will read the, um, a string from that address, and if it matches the string just after that, it will auto-detect um, the device. So we can validate our profile using the auto-detection feature that will read the string. Um, that's what's shown here, and here we can see it in operation with broadcom to dump uh, first patching the code on the first uh, three line and then proceeding on dumping the requested uh, memory content. Um, the process is clearly more tedious, but it can be fully automated, uh, as I've shown with a bit of Python and Radar2. Uh, and it's way faster, like the initial methods of using the uh, Equals console, it takes around seven hours to dump a full firmware image. Uh, with this technique, it takes like 30 minutes. And of course, sometimes there is no other way. It's either that or patching the SPI flash using uh, like SOIC clips and a programmer. So whichever you like, but this is a technique that you can do without too much of um, hardware hacking. All right, so back to our firmware dump. Um, although it looks like uh, ready to be loaded in your software reverse engineering tool of choice, um, it's actually not. So firmware are packed into program store images. It's a custom format from Broadcom uh, that starts with a well-defined header followed by the compressed uh, binary content of that uh, firmware. So the header format is really simple, uh, but we really, we're really interested in two specific values, the program load address uh, that we will need when loading it in Gitra and the CRC uh, that we need to recompute if we are repacking uh, custom firmers. Um, and also, so most firmware images are compressed using LZMA. Um, interestingly, Broadcom released the source code of its program store utility. It can be used to unpack and repack firmware images. Um, they released it as part of their new uh, RTOS called Zephyr, uh, and we can use it to extract the actual firmware. So you see the different uh, header being printed out, and the actual binary is written to an output file. So now that we have our firmware image, it's time to analyze it. We can uh, load it in Kitra as a MIPS32 uh, begin in binary with the load address we just read from the program store header. However, there is a big uh, problem. We don't have symbols, we don't have function names, we don't have memory mappings. It's a huge block of code that makes almost no sense. Uh, so you have to remember that there is no concept of syscalls on uh, real-time operating systems like ECOS. So you can't do bottom up tracing like you would do on a Linux firmware, um, identifying, for example, the syscall to exec VE and then um, doing a bottom up approach to find libc functions uh, that uh, implement exec VE. So let's see what we can do to fix this. So. This is the plan. Um, we want to identify standard library functions. We want to rename a good uh, portion of the functions, identify C++ vtables, and get a good understanding of uh, memory mappings. Uh, 
So the first step is to identify equal standard library functions using a signature library. Uh, you can call it flirt, function ID, signature libraries, or signature if you are a fan of Reader 2. It's all the same. It's function pattern match matching. Um, and equal source code being GPL licensed, uh, vendors are obligated to release their um, own version of ECOS. Um, not the added layer, but the actual ECOS core that they used uh, to build those firmers. So what we can do is download the code, uh, compile uh, shared objects with debug symbols for our target architecture, load them into Gitra, generate function ID databases, and then use that to auto-identify standard libraries within Gitra. It's fully automated. There is a tool online that I published to do that. Um, I won't cover all the details, but it took some serious time uh, due to weird requirements like 12, 12 years old GCC versions, patches from ECOS. I ended up running everything in a really outdated CentOS VM. Um, if you want to reproduce that, uh, there is a Vagrant file online, um, but I um, also published the function ID databases. So at the end of the process, we have more than 1,200 functions signatures spanning 26 standard libraries. Um, that's nice. But I actually wanted more, so we will see um, if we can uh, apply the function renaming technique I used in the bootloader, but for the main firmer. Um, and firmers are full of function tracing login calls that contain the function name. You have an example here. Um, this is another example. Another example, you have actually four different um, login functions that are used throughout the uh, firmer. Um, so given a list of known login functions, we can identify uh, where they're, from where they're called, extract the function name from the parameter, and rename the calling function with that name. Um, so another thing is that um, given that most of the firmware has been developed in C++, when you extract the function name, it will follow the C++ um, convention of class name, colon, colon, function name. So we know the class name from which um, we can identify functions that are part of a C++ class and automatically um, set the calling fun uh, convention of that function to this call which will make the this value point to the vtable. And um, knowing where the vtable is located, uh, usually in Gitra, you have a label on top of the vtable, which is usually ptr underscore fun underscore something. Um, and here with a script, we can rename the label to get like class name colon colon vtable. Um, and this is what it looks like. We have Broadcom equals message queue, uh, class with its vtable and the different functions that are part of that class. Um, it's super useful because a side effect of it is that we can uh, understand how the developers used inheritance and polymorphism. And in this case, uh, you have like some functions that were not renamed, but given where they're located and to which class they belong, we can do a proper um, guesstimation of uh, what they're actually doing. Uh, with all these methods put together, we can identify close to 10% of any given protocols based ECOS firmware, which is, seems um, not a lot, but it actually is because there's lots of uh, garbage functions uh, within firmwares. Um, so now that we have auto-renamed a good chunk of Broadcom's uh, functions, we also identified and renamed C++ vtables. It's time to get a good understanding of the memory mapping. Um, so by memory mapping, I mean how the firmware is loaded in RAM at runtime. Um, ideally, we would like to know the address of vectors, the text segment, data segment, BSS segment, the stack and heap locations. Um, I won't cover vectors here because we don't have hours, uh, but if you're re really into MIPS assembly, interrupt and ex exception vectors, uh, everything is documented on the equals.wtf blog. Um, the text is always mapped at the load address. That was easy. We can extract it from the um, uh, program store header. Um, the data segments, they're always hard to map precisely for uh, show firmer uh, binaries, unless it always starts with the same string, which is the case with Broadcom. 
Um, they always start with BCM0, which is the first um, of its uh, network interface name. And the end of that uh, data segment can also be easily identified because it's uh, full of null bytes, like thousands of them. Uh, and the identification can be fully automated using Python string, string matching code, like the one here. Um, so for the BSS segment, it's actually zeroed out on boot um, by the, an equals core function called al zero BSS. And for our target archi architecture, it's defined in pure MIPS assembly in vectors.s. Um, but to us, the most important bits of information from the assembly are that the code loads the start address of the BSS segment into register A0 and the end address of the BSS segment into register A1. Um, and on top of that, al zero BSS is always located at the same offset uh, for all of Broadcom firmware images, regardless of vendors, be it uh, technical or Netgear, AS key, um, they're always located at the same offset. So we can, um, given an arbitrary firmware file, we can disassemble the function at that offset to obtain BSS start and BSS end. And this is an example from a Netgear uh, firmware where we, we can see that uh, BSS starts at uh, 8161.68.8 and BSS end at 81.B5.25.70. Now for the stack location, uh, the console prompt allows you to print all the running tasks by typing task show. And if you order them uh, by task ID, you will find that T startup is always the first uh, thread to um, be launched. Uh, once the device is booted, that's where it is. Um, therefore, that uh, specific thread stack base address will be the whole system stacks base address. Um, and so tasks are launched on ECOS using a standard function called seek thread create. And we, here we can see uh, the T startup thread being launched in assembly. Uh, and this uh, th seek thread create function expects eight parameters. Two of them are of interest to us, the thread name and the uh, stack base address. So knowing all this, we can also identify the stack base address for any given firmware by finding the T startup string, doing a cross reference of that string uh, where it's used as a parameter to seek thread create and then extract the stack base parameter from that call. Um, finding the EAP start address was way easier. It always starts immediately after the BSS segment, so done. And all of this can be implemented with a dumb pattern matching code that does not even disassemble uh, the firmware code. This code is open source, available on GitHub, and you will get the whole um, um, memory map. Uh, and if we put everything together, uh, this is what the runtime memory of an ecosystem looks like on MIPS. Um, so you have the um, vectors, interrupt handlers at uh, the lowest addresses, then your uh, executable code at the text segment, your data segment, the BSS where the stack is located, and then your heap. Uh, the stack grows upwards and the heap grows downwards. Um, one thing to note is that all of these uh, memory regions are read write executes. There is no permissions flags uh, on memory pages, there is no execute bits, there is no by, there's no ASLR, it's a write anywhere, run anything uh, type of system, which is good, I mean, to us. Um, so going back to our memory map offsets, uh, we can now use them to get an even better uh, picture of our system in Gitra. You could even alt the system, take a full snapshot, and analyze that snapshot in Gitra um, with all these uh, offsets. Right, um, so now that we have everything we need, let's find bugs. Um, so outside of logical bugs, the most interesting bugs from an offensive security perspective are memory corruptions. Um, arbitrary command injections, injections do not exist on ECOS, uh, given that it does not uh, implement like sub-process calls APIs like system, exec VE or popen. Um, so let's start by covering a few memory corruption bugs uh, I found. Hope it's readable. Um, so this is the first one I found on the Netgear devices here. It's a classic call to store copy to copy untrusted user input into a fixed size buffer on the stack. 
Um, it's part of the parental control um, page of the web administration interface. This is uh, how it can be triggered. Um, so you send a bunch of A's as part of the text block parameter and it will overflow. Um, this is another stack overflow, this time targeting the TCG 300 from ASKey, uh, another classic called to Stonecat um, to copy interested user input into a fixed size buffer. The error here is that they um, compute the length of interested user input and the length is tainted, so like you have a, an overflow. Um, the bug can be triggered with this simple request uh, and in this case the user needs to be authenticated. Interestingly, it also affects the parental controls uh, page, even though it's a different vendor and a different feature, like different uh, implementation. Um, and this one is a heap overflow. Uh, I won't cover the full chain, but it basically parses HTTP requests line by line, matching on fixed header uh, names, such as host or content length, um, and then performs an unsafe copy of the header value into a structure allocated on a heap. And this is the easiest triggers of all. Just send a bunch of A's as part of the host header, make the device crash. Um, so all of these bugs will trigger this kind of message over the serial connection. Uh, there is a custom handler defined for uh, things like segfaults, uh, store load exceptions, breakpoints, and it will dump all the register values, the program counter, and the affected threads details. So in our case, the return address is now 41414141 because we sent a bunch of A's. Um, given the lack of uh, debugging abilities on this platform, uh, with the exception of the register dump on segfaults I've just shown, um, the best strategy is to craft a very small drop chain um, that I would call a stage one that will fetch or receive a second stage that we can compile for our target. This way we don't have to debug overly long drop chains by constantly crashing, capturing output, rebooting, crashing, capturing output. Um, and we can do everything uh, with a single, um, really simple drop chain. Um, so the ID is this one. It's actually, um, it's actually from uh, the exploit method from Liarbird that published the cable hound uh, paper. So the ID is that you um, take control of the return address, you execute your drop chain, the drop chain will um, establish a connection to a remote server, pull the payload, write the payload to memory and jump to that specific payload. But the payload um, actually will reuse the same socket file descriptor. So like your stage two delivery will be the same, using the same channel as your reverse shell. It's done by just um, saving the file descriptor integer value to a fixed address in memory, in this case uh, named socfd underscore addr. And this um, value is also known to your payload, so it will just fetch the file descriptor value and reuse that uh, socket. Um, the shell code, um, we actually need to do some reverse engineering to create a console object, um, which will be similar to like calling bin.sh on Linux, um, because that does not exist. Like you don't have a um, default method of doing that on ECOS, so we need to reverse how Broadcom did it. Um, right, so let's recap the exploitation phase. So we identified different kinds of memory corruption vulnerabilities. We managed to gain control over the program counter and designed a shop chain to uh, pull shellcode from a remote server. Uh, but let's do a quick um, demo. So we are on Netgear. So this is the device here. I'm connecting uh, connected over LAN. They're not emitting any wireless signal. Um, no need to try exploiting them. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully this should work. Uh, right, yeah. Um, so we got a reverse shell on the device. This is what the menu looks like. Um, so you have access to a bunch of features. You can uh, edit routing, uh, routing rules, you can access uh, uh, credentials, you can do some monitoring, you can inject uh, um, 
custom uh, shellcode at runtime because you have like write and read memory um, um, command uh, options. So like it's full control of the device. It's similar to getting root on uh, any kind of uh, server. Um, the exploit is public, but the payload is not. So you will get like a callback, but that's all. Um, I think that's it. no. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So speaking of shellcode, so shellcode is the art of building binary code for a custom target that will execute a specific action. Uh, usually, this is a piece of malicious code. In our case, we want this piece of code to establish a reverse shell to or um, C2, like I uh, demonstrated. So given Ecos uh, POSIX APIs, we have access to something uh, really close to libc. So you have access to bind, connect, select, malloc, uh, memcopy, uh, all of these uh, functions uh, that were actually identified using the function ID database I demonstrated uh, earlier. And we can use that to write custom shellcode. Um, but as I said, I, uh, we need to reverse the interactive console implementation. Uh, remember that there is no syscalls, so no exec VE, BNSH, that does not exist there. Um, so we have two ways of building um, our own eco shell codes, either manual function hooking and code fix up. It's the method used by uh, Liarbird, um, but it's really prone to errors. It's kind of, so they're using the same techniques that you would use to um, uh, hook functions using LD preload. The problem is that the shell code is not location aware. So if you have um, jump in instructions, it tends to jump somewhere else. Uh, so it fails. And another technique is using simply the GCC linker, which I consider the best uh, method. Um, it was inspired by a research from someone who turned those cable modems into FM receivers, because we have like the coaxial cable. Uh, coaxial antenna uh, behind. Um, and this is what it looks like. Right. So, if it's not readable, tell me, I will zoom in. Um, so this is our make file. Um, we can build a different kind of shell code. You have bind shell, reverse shell. Uh, whatever. Um, we select a, a platform, so either a Netgear one or an AS key, and we are loading a specific uh, linker definition for that uh, platform. Um, the linker definition is simply this, so you provide all the addresses of the functions we you want to use in your shellcode, and they will be linked by GCC when you compile uh, the shellcode. Um, and of course, so let's say you will map um, your shellcode at a specific uh, memory offset. You need to provide it there. So all the call, like the jump calls, will be um, computed based on, based on that. Um, and this is what the uh, reverse shell implementation looks like. Um, it's quite simple. Uh, like the usual, you open a socket, you connect to it, you allocate a buffer, and what's really interested is the Proscom implementation for the console. So you get a singleton. Um, this is used to, uh, like those three lines for, from 47 to 49, is to redirect IO to the file descriptor that is uh, linked to your socket. Um, and then you set, so you receive a command from the C2. You assign it to the singleton, and then you uh, provide that singleton as Broadcom console execute current command, uh, and it will execute it. That's how uh, the uh, reversal here is working. Uh, and in a nice final touch is the exit call, where it will reassign the uh, I.O. to the original uh, handler. So, for example, if you're connected over serial or telnet, when you get a reverse shell on it, you can't type any more on telnet or serial. So you need to reassign the I.O. to that uh, specific handler. Um, all right. Uh, and another example is this one, which is a bit more complex because I'm actually using threads. 
Um, so I'm using the eCourse API to create like a stack for our thread. Um, I'm creating it and I'm launching it and basically like the thread will run this function which, which is exactly the same one as I uh, shown just uh, just before. Um, there were some difficulties in writing this like given that you are uh, compiling static shell codes, you can't allocate on some large uh, memory in a uh, data segment, for example. So I had to reuse the heap. So it's quite complex, but it's an interesting read if you uh, want to look into it. Uh, right, so persistence. So we have a uh, reversal uh, access on those devices. Um, and we want to get in long-term uh, persistence. So either via a rootkit, a firmware implant, or bootkit, a bootloader implant. Um, let's see how we can do that. So there is no secure boot implementations. Uh, there is no signature checking. As long as the uh, CRC of our firmware matches, the platform will run it. And of course, there are uh, built-in commands to update the firmware image over TFTP. Um, so there are those um, two commands um, that are doing the exact same thing, uh, download and save the firmware to flash. It's just that they take different paths. So IPL will run over the LAN and DOCSYS-CTL will go over the CMTS network uh, over the coaxial connection. Um, so the idea to uh, create an implant is to identify a function that is not required for uh, normal operation. Um, in my case, so you need to find a function that is called uh, on boot and that will launch a thread. So we need to find a thread that is uh, not uh, ne necessary for the device normal operation. In my case, I'm using an IPsec handler because, well, it's there, it's part of Broadcom packages, but they're not used by those uh, um, ISP um, devices. So you find that function, you find the start of sets and the end of sets, you create a shell code and you just overwrite uh, that uh, segment within your firmware, then you repack it into a program store um, file and you can just have your implant uh, saved. Um, for bootkit, um, it's the same thing, no secure boot implementation or signature checking. The platform will run any bootloader freely and again, built-in commands to update the bootloader over TFTP. Same thing than before. Um, so backdooring the bootloader is totally doable. I did some demonstration, just printing out um, some uh, custom strings. Um, the ideal uh, bootkit would be a bootloader that injects custom code into the firmware images before booting it which would mean like shell access for the next 10 years because firmers can still be uploaded if something something is uh, detected. Um, but I didn't go um, as far as that. However, um, I have a demonstration for persistence. So let's open a serial connection to our device and let's reboot it. Okay, um, so this is the, um, so we have two firmware, uh, there's image one and image two. In image two, you see that it's actually called uh, implant.out, which is the implanted uh, firmware. Um, I'm just hitting enter, we don't care about those. So we will boot from flash and select the second image. Okay. So we'll let it boot. We see that it's loading image two. It's actually printed out the debug output of like loading a bind, uh, list, uh, bind shell listener, but it's usually too fast to see it. So we'll see. Launching the AP access point. Just waiting. All right, so let's demonstrate that. So we are connected over LAN. We should be able to reach it. Yeah, so if I do this, 
we have a bind shell on the device because the firmware is uh, has a specific shell code implement in it, which can't be uh, detected uh, right now. Uh, that's it. Let's get back. So let's go over some recommendations before we close this session. Um, for I ISP customers, um, they should disable guest Wi-Fi. They should use non-default settings for PSK, PSK and SSIDs. Uh, this is based on existing research I did on Netgear and uh, ASKey. Like the um, heap overflow is exploitable uh, from by an authenticated user connected to your guest Wi-Fi. So just disable it. Um, default PSK and SSIDs uh, are derivable or can be used as a Oracle when you exploit those uh, Netgear devices. So please do this if you are using those devices. Um, for ISPs, um, I think they should do complete and in-depth pen test of devices they deploy. Uh, the cost of breach or large-scale large, large scale exploitation is way higher than the cost of such a test. Um, as a measure, the vulnerabilities I identified in VU, in, uh, VU took uh, nine months of dedicated effort by the security team to deploy configuration changes, um, and some of them hurt their help desk uh, really badly. Um, and ISPs should also take into considera consideration the support provided by the device manufacturers. Um, is the device, will the device still be deployed when it reaches end of life? Uh, what happens if a bug is found and can't be fixed in code, which is the case in uh, those two devices? Um, for uh, manufacturers like Netgear or ASKey, I think they should disable the crash handler uh, so that exploit writers are blind. Uh, it's pretty much writing, getting back to writing rock chains on pen and paper, which is a pain in the ass. Um, do source code reviews. Uh, AS SASTs are cheap now. Uh, use strong defaults, be it for passwords, protocols, ciphers. Um, provide long-term support, uh, or at least be explicit in your uh, contractual agreements. Um, maybe sign your firmware uh, cryptographically, even though I'm sure it will never happen on this uh, platform. For Broadcom, source code review, again, please do it. Um, Arden, your heap manager, uh, it's just a joke at this point. It's looked like it's been written by an undergrad. Um, maybe look into secure boots. Um, I know they're looking into it for more recent uh, RTOS uh, they're working on, like Zephyr. Um, and for future work, I would like to look at other, well, I'm looking at other uh, ECOS implementations, uh, things like OT devices and PLCs from Moxa, Zyxol, um, or switches from net, uh, other switches uh, from uh, Netgear. Um, I would like also, this was an initially thought to be published today, but I'm not there yet. Uh, it's to build a GDB stub for the cable modem that is injectable at runtime. Um, I know it's doable, uh, that's why I reversed the interrupt and exception vectors on uh, ECOS, but I'm not there yet. Uh, there is a lot of uh, engineering effort uh, that needs to be uh, put into it. Um, your ID here, uh, if you're interested in ECOS. Um, all the tools I demonstrated are open source, so reverse engineering tools, Git loaders, uh, the shellcode generator, um, exploits uh, that are defunct for some of them, a um, bunch of references, but all of the, the complete list, like with uh, hundreds of uh, references, are on ECOS.wtf. I will uh, now thank you for your attention, and we can move to Q&A. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm mainly excited about the end when you mentioned the future work. Are you already familiar with some OTICS implementations for, for ECOS? I, I'm just curious to know more about that and what directions this yeah. goes. You, you have two main vendors that are using ECOS for PLCs um, or, um, for example, Ethernet to Modbus um, um, translators. Um, the, it's uh, Zyxol and Moxa. 
Um, they're quite different from those uh, devices because they are using ARM and not, not MIPS. Uh, but you can apply the same thing, like um, getting access to the source code, building function ID databases, doing the reverse engineering work, finding flows. Um, so those are the two um, vendors I'm looking into at the moment. And the other is Netgear, but it's basically just dumb switches uh, that, are, that are not uh, directly related to PLCs or OT devices. All right, thank you.